number of times uh, where um, where they're doing updates and it just uh, makes it a problem. Anyway, the outline, what we're going to be talking about is feeding ecology. What is it? What does it mean? And we're going to talk about what birds eat. And it's, I, I think I find this a very fascinating subject and when they eat it. Okay. And we'll talk about the adaptations that makes it possible for these birds, both their senses, in other words, their sight and hearing, but also the hardware. Okay, think of feet and bills and wings as being hardware. That's that's what it is. We'll talk about different feeding techniques and food security, and then we'll, we'll summarize what we're up to. Okay, but basically, feeding ecology is a, a relationship between the environment, the evolutionary processes. In other words, why different species of birds and families of birds have different beak shapes and foot shapes and wing shapes, and the feeding behavior of the organisms or I like it, it's simplest is where birds feed, the adaptations that help them to feed and how and when birds feed. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And I hope we come away with, the, with this, with the understanding that how diverse um, the bird life is and the, just the many, many different feeding behaviors and adaptations that birds have that make it possible for them to feed. But if we, if we look at the general, um, groupings of birds, we have specialists. And we're gonna be talking about each of these uh, various different groups, the specialists. These are basically birds that eat one thing, okay? And then generalists, these are something that will eat practically anything. Then we have carnivores, insectivores, granivores, those are the seed eaters, vegetarians, fructivores, those are the fruit eaters, nectivores, things like hummingbirds and other birds, like, uh, pollen eaters, and some of these uh, birds could be a couple of these different things, but they're primarily one or the other. Sap eaters and carrion eaters. So these are the groupings that we'll be talking about today as we go forward. And we'll be talking about the various different adaptations that these um, different birds or groups of birds have. The first one, if you have traveled to Southern Florida or to the New World tropics, snail kites, okay? And they the, both the snail kite and the limpkin, which is another bird of the of Florida and Texas Gulf Coast and places like that. But but these snail kites feed on snails. That's all they eat. Okay, so all of the snail kites. And, and when I started birding, this is called Everglades kite. So change names, as so many birds have. But notice the the, the shape of the bill on this this hawk. Okay, uh, and notice how it's curved, and that is perfect for reaching inside a snail, and in order to push its beak into the snail and then extract the um, the snail out of its shell. So these these are they don't eat anything else. Okay, if there are not these specific snails around, that you won't find this bird. So we certainly don't have them in Massachusetts, and you don't have them in Wyoming or anything else. But these, these birds, um, in order to find them, you have to go to that specific habitat. For example, in the case of the snail kite to the Everglades, okay? Or uh, in the um, freshwater marshes in the New World tropics. Uh, so middle America, um, Southern Mexico down to Panama, for example. So that's one, they eat one thing and that's all. And so if that, if that food source goes away, they either die out or they have to move away, okay? And then one of our, just for me, the, one of my favorite birds of all is this common raven. And this bird, if you notice it, is in really beautiful plumage. This is at the height of the breeding plumage. Notice the iridescence on the, on the plumage. In other words, the, the structure of the feathers, the melanin inside the, inside the feather acts like a prism. So you is, just get reflected certain lights back. But notice on the chest of this bird, it's a little bit of a purplish uh, tint to it, really beautiful. And these are among the most intelligent animals, all the corvids, so the crows and the magpies and the, uh, the ravens. Uh, and of course, they have an incredibly important uh, position in, um, with native peoples. Uh, this is an incredibly important spiritual bird. Um, it's, it's a creator. It's in a lot of traditions, it's a bringer of light because it was a raven that flew up to the sky and put a hole in the sky in order to let the sun shine come in. 
Um, but this, this will eat anything. It eats trash, it eats bird eggs, it eats small birds, it eats reptiles, it will eat everything. And that way it's just able to um, be successful in so many different habitat types. This happens to be a photograph I took in, um, in the Grand Canyon. Okay. okay. So then we have our carnivores. And for a lot of people, this is really one of the most exciting groups of birds. This happens to be a peregrine falcon. And I know that uh, they are either uh, in your area or pass through your area. And they are flesh eaters with the hooked bill and everything. Notice another thing about these birds. Notice how its eyes are facing directly forward, okay? Just like ours are. Well, if you're a robin, okay, you, you can have an eye on one side of your head and an eye on the other side, because if you're looking for worms, you put your head down, you're looking down for the worm at the same time your other eye is looking for possible predators, okay? But this is a pursuit hunter and it needs to have binocular vision. And just like we have binocular vision, the, the distance between our eyes or the distance between the eyes of this bird forms a triangle with whatever it's looking at and therefore it can judge its distance. So peregrine falcons, prairie falcons that you have out in your area, and the red-tailed hawks. And we'll talk about feet and other things in a moment. So you have Eastern Phoebes, you also have uh, Western Phoebes, I'm mean, sorry, uh, kingbirds, Eastern and Western kingbirds. Uh, and these are insectivores. Talk about a little bit more about its feeding behavior. But typically this happens to be on a sumac bush and they typically see, uh, sit on the top of that or on a post or something, fly out, catch something and come back. Uh, all of our Eastern kingbirds have been gone from us for oh, at least three or four weeks. Um, they're, they're already, most of them are already in Central and South America already. So extraordinary um, migrants. Okay, you have uh, song sparrows. Now this is our Eastern, this is Melodia melodia. This is a subspecies um, that is common in our area. But as you go further to the West and further North, you get different subspecies. So in a lot of cases, your song, song sparrows or some of your song sparrows aren't gonna look like this. They're gonna look bigger and they're gonna look darker. But this is uh, in the case of, this is primarily a seed eater, except when there are lots of insects around or they have babies and they start feeding on insects and insect larvae and things of that nature to feed their young one. But the bill is, primarily designed for eating seeds, okay? Now you have gadwalls. Um, this is the beautiful female. I, I just got, I caught, took this image on the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. So they, they feed by typically swimming along in the water and eating the vegetation off the top of the water or occasionally tilt feeding. Um, these are the ones that uh, the gadwalls for us, they breed, the females breed about a month after the, our American black ducks and mallards. So at this time of year, if you see little relatively small ducks, it's probably the young of a gadwall, but, but they'll feed in the water or on the land. So they, again, they have, can eat, they can do well in salt marshes as well as freshwater marshes or walking along somebody's lawn. Now, fructivores, this is a uh, uh, lilac crowned uh, parrot, which I photographed in El Paso, Texas. Uh, of this, these parrots have been introduced and really doing quite well in various different places in the country. But these are um, uh, primarily fruit eaters and farmers don't like them. Okay. Now you have a, out in the Western part of the country, you have a lot of hummingbirds. We basically have two in the East. We have the ruby throated hummingbird and the rufous hummingbird sometimes in the late fall, but that's basically it. And they, they're eating nectar. This happens to be obviously an artificial feeder here, but they will um, get nectar by, in this case, doing being beneficial to the host plant that they're getting. So as they go in to get the nectar out of the flower, they're actually uh, picking up pollen that then they take to the next flower and uh, deposit the pollen. Uh, in the New World Tropics, we have a lot of nectar eaters also, but the, the, a group of birds called flower piercers, and they cheat. Instead of going in from the flower through the bell of the flower to get the nectar and, and, and transport pollen away, they make a hole at the bottom of the blossom and reach in with their tongues to get the nectar. But anyway, ne nectivores, 
pollinators. Now, a lot of birds eat pollen, especially during migration. Um, in the east, for example, early May, uh, we have a lot of oak trees. Uh, and those oak trees have blossoms. The blossoms are before the leaves come out. And so a lot of the newly arrived ones like our Baltimore Oriole here or Rose-Breasted Grosbeak and a number will be eating pollen uh, for, for the nutrients because there are very few insects around. And there are other, other birds, a lot of birds, some wood warblers and things like that also eat pollen as an important part of their diet. Okay. Now this is our yellow-bellied sapsucker, but if I put a tiny bit of red on the nape on the back of the neck of this bird, you have your red nape sapsucker, which is, uh, is your common sapsucker uh, out in your area and, and further south. And what they're doing, this, this whole tree is, has all these holes in it that are made by the sapsucker. Uh, and notice just to behind the head of the sapsucker, it's actually moist there. So what these birds are doing is they're coming in making these holes, just like, well, I don't know if you do maple syrup out that way, but we sure do. And you put a hole in the tree and the sap comes out and you, you make maple syrup out of it or something like that. Well, they, they are also eating this sap, but they're also eating the insects that are attracted to the sap. Whenever there's a break in a tree, uh, the sap becomes available and very often small insects will come to take advantage of that uh, sap and the sap, seeders, sap suckers are not only eating the sap, but they're eating the insects that are attracted there. Okay. Then you have carrier. Now, I know that uh, the black vultures are very uncommon in Wyoming, but turkey vultures are very common. I just wanted to show you this black vulture with a dead opossum. Oh, this is a bird that used to be restricted to the southern and southeastern part of the United States, but they actually nest now in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And they are carrion feeders. Uh, the turkey vulture that you have commonly out there is a hunts by smell, and the turkey, uh, the black vulture is a sight hunter. So here are two different vultures that are using different methods in order to find their prey. Um, and where uh, black vultures are common, you'll very often see them in flocks of turkey vultures. So carrion eaters, they're the they're the sort of the garbage collectors, and they they help keep our environment clean. Okay, so well, those are the various birds. And then, but within each group, in, in order to avoid direct competition with each other, uh, species have evolved different physical and behavioral characteristics that facilitate feeding. And one of these things is feeding at different times of the day. Uh, there you have diurnal ones, these are the daytime hunters or the nocturnal ones. So you think of many owls, but we have diurnal owls too but most of the owls that you see are not nocturnal. And then the crepuscular ones. These are the ones that typically feed at twilight or crepuscular means twilight. So you can have a crepuscular feeder, but you can also have a crepuscular migrant. Things like blackbirds are typically migrating early in the morning and late in the afternoon during twilight. So just some of the uh, bird that you see out in your area as a, I don't know if they breed in your area, but certainly as a passage migrant moving through your area, this is Wilson's warbler. Just one of these beautiful birds, the same uh, size as a chickadee, about the same size as a chickadee. And these are clearly a diurnal hunting birds. One thing to notice about this bird is notice the size of the eye versus the side of the face. It's relatively small. You could, you could tell that this is a diurnal hunter because of the shape and size of the eye, but it's also a, a warbler that hunts in more or less in the open, okay? Because if, if, you're, if you're a dark woods uh, warbler, you have a much relatively much bigger eye. But this is Wilson's warbler and it, it's, it depends on its keen sight of uh, a sight in order to find tiny little insects and insect larvae size of a chickadee. Okay. Typical one of the uh, nighttime is this is a barred owl. Okay, I believe that you have, um, don't have these out where you are, but this is a large owl. <coughs> Excuse me. And they rely on both their sight, incredible sight, but also hearing. Uh, and, and they use both of those um, abilities to do that. Okay. And the, a crepuscular feeder, this is one that you probably see flying around in your area in the late uh, afternoon on very cloudy days or in the morning. 
Um, this is the short eared owl. And I think one of the things that this image really shows, notice how big the head is relative to the body. It's enormous. If I go back one slide, the same thing with the owls. When I get to a hawk, I want you to notice how small the head is relative to the, the, the rest of the, the body. But this, why is this important? Well, if you're going to triangulate on something because you're going to be feeding in, in the twilight when the light isn't very good, you want to get your ears as far apart as you can. So again, you can triangulate. So the base of your triangle is the distance between your ears and the two legs of the triangle are you're, you're looking at your, the possible prey item. So to have your eyes relatively far apart and your ears relatively far apart is a huge help in being able to tri triangulate on your prey, okay? So some of the physical, uh, uh, psychological, physiological, sorry, uh, adaptations, the senses are things like their sight. We talked briefly about that, but sight, detecting ultraviolet light, okay? We can't do that, okay? But a lot of birds and a lot of mammals can. The sight in very low light conditions, okay? Very stormy day or at nighttime or very, when it's very, very cloudy. Okay, hearing, okay? Chemosensory ability, we think of it as taste, okay? And then smell. So these are the various, the different senses that birds have in different um, acuity, depending on what their prey is. We, we talked uh, before about uh, the, Peregrine falcon, but here's the red-tailed hawk. Now, if you look at this red-tailed hawk and say, wow, that doesn't look like our red-tailed hawk. Well, no, it doesn't most of the time because out in the Western part of the country, we have much darker, we have much darker uh, red-tailed hawks uh, than, than we do here in the East. This is our typical red-tailed hawk with that band of uh, darkened feathers across the breast. And their sight has got to be extraordinary because you'll very often see them soaring high over a field and they're just, they're using that as a flying perch, okay? They could perch in a tree and watch, but they can cover so much more area if they're using updrafts and thermals to circle over an area looking for prey, whether it's a snake, a young bird, a mammal, whatever it happen, happens to be. But they, they have to have this incredible vision in order to do that. And think of uh, passing through your area, you, I believe you have violet green swallows and barn swallows and tree swallows. Just imagine you flying around in over an open area and think of, they're catching among other things, mosquitoes. Now they're flying along and they they can actually detect the presence of mosquitoes and other tiny little insects as they're flying along. Just shows what incredible sight they have. Okay. Okay, sighting in the ultraviolet. This, birds, birds can see a much broader spectrum of light than we can. Um, ultraviolet light, we, we don't see that. And some birds actually could uh, de detect their food by seeing the reflected light, the uh, ultraviolet light, either off the insects or fruit. Okay, so when you think of a little caterpillar, a green caterpillar, a tiny little green caterpillar on the underside of a green leaf, and it's almost impossible to see us, those little larvae are also giving off slight, slight amounts of ultraviolet light. And that's what helps the bird, because they can detect these small amounts of ultraviolet light, it helps them, it, it sort of looks like a little, little beacon against the green leaf. So that's one thing they do. And the other thing is a lot of hawks, the red-tailed hawks and, and some of the owls can actually see the ultraviolet light that's being reflected off the territory marking urine that mammals are displaying. So think of a, um, a, a vole or a mole or something like that that's going through a grass marking its territory, but also leaving little drops of urine behind that these uh, birds predatory birds can actually see these tiny traces of ultraviolet light and helps them find a prey species. So another way to look at it is a site in very low light conditions, okay? Um, so most of the nocturnal birds have eye adaptations that let them look ex extraordinary little light. They have typically very large eyes, 
They have large, many more photoreceptors in the eyes. And something that may be a new term to you, but tapetum lucidum, I will, I will show you that in a moment. But this happens in the leaf litter is a rufous night jar. I, I took this photograph in, um, in, in Belize, but the, the idea is well, if you have a nighthawk or whippoorwill or Chuck Will's widow, these are all in a group of birds called goat suckers. Goat suckers, so, sort of an interesting term. Uh, it basically came out of the, the, the Greeks and people who were out in their field with, uh, with their livestock, like goats or sheep and things like that. And th the tradition or the myth was that these little birds that spent the whole day laying in the grass or in the leaves where they couldn't be detected would be right among the, the sheep and the goats. And the myth arrived that, they, that these birds actually suckled on the goats. And that's where they got the name goat suckers. Okay, but they don't, they, they just eat insects. Okay, but th that is a case where they have extraordinary uh, visibility. I mean, I've, I've gone out with groups of people and looking for them. Uh, and for our eye, we cannot really discern anything. And yet these birds are just sitting on the ground, they see a moth or a beetle fly overhead, and they just hop up and grab it. And one, one way of that, I get people to see these things if there's a street light along a country lane or something with a street light uh, very often you can you can see the eye shine of, of these birds so many nocturnal animals uh, I don't know if you ever have but if you have gone to um, a field trip say in the new world tropics Panama or Costa Rica or someplace like that if you have a really good tour company and a really good guide I mean they will take you out for a, for a night ride or a night walk with a big light. And what they'll do is you'll shine the light up in the trees and everything, and you'll see yellow or orangey yellow, looks like little tiny flashlights looking back at you. Well, those are the, those are the eyes, reflection of the eyes from the mammals or from these, um, some, of the, some of the birds. And the, the, the tapetum lucidum is a layer of tissue behind the retina, uh, behind the retina. And the idea, if you think of it this way, if this, my, this, my right hand is the retina. So the light comes in through the retina, it goes beyond the retina to a group of cells behind here. And that's the tapetum lucidum. And the tapetum lucidum act as a mirror. So the light, the bird sees it going through the retina, coming to the retina. It goes beyond the retina. The tapetum lucidum bounces that same light wave back again, so the eye can see it a second time. Okay. So if you're out at nighttime and you see an animal with glowing eyes looking back at you, that's the tapetum lucidum that you're seeing that helps the birds be able to see in tremendous low light. And this is, this is a, a, a bird that we don't see anywhere around here. This is Northern Potu. Okay, this is one roost again night. Now this is a very unusual image I took here because usually the bird is turned around the other way with its tail going down the, the branch and the head just sticking up. And they spend the whole day just sitting in plain view, but they're usually, if they have a better posture like this, it just blends right in with the branch so predators don't even see it. But this same bird at nighttime, notice the eye shine, that yellowish golden color eye shine. And that's again, the reflected light that you're seeing from the tapetum lucidum behind the retina. So this is a bird that can that hunts in total darkness and yet can see minuscule amounts of light. Okay, hearing is a big deal. Woodpeckers and owls. We talked about owls before, but woodpeckers. Okay, this happens to be a pileated or pileated woodpecker. I know that you don't have them out where you are, but this is our largest woodpecker. Uh, and it goes along, uh, lands on a tree and just listens for the noise made by uh, beetle larvae and things like that that are inside the wood. And that they, they start pounding on the tree in order to get to that, uh, the larva that they can, the larva inside is eating the cellulose, eating the uh, heartwood of the uh, tree and the woodpeckers can hear that. Okay, this sensory, hemosensory ability. Okay, this is this happens. To, I think during migration you may get some of these long-billed dowagers or 
things of that nature. Um, and this, this long bill is used for probing down into the mud. And at the tip of the bill is very, very sensitive um, to its the chemical receptors at the end. So think of a tasting. So when they stick their bill down into the mud, okay, they're, they're actually, the scientific word I think is snorfing around. Actually, they stick their bill in the mud until they hit on something that, that basically tastes, tastes good to them. And then they, with their bill, they open up just the tip of the bill and they grab either the worm or the, the bivalve or whatever it is that they're, they're getting. But so they, they are very, very sensitive to different chemical compounds and that's how they find their food. Smell turkey vultures, we talked about that briefly before about these are the birds that circle overhead and they're actually smelling the mice, most minute amount of um, you know, smell coming off some dead animal or something, okay? But there are a lot of other birds that that uh, we, we can see here along the East Coast if we go on a whale watch trip or something like that, but the shearwaters and things. And, and just to tell you, if, if we go out on a whale watch boat, if you have a really good uh, field trip leader, uh, they will have a big bag of popcorn, huge bag of popcorn, the trash can bag, that full of popcorn. And they also have some bottles of cod liver oil. Okay. So you're sailing out on this uh, bird trip to try to see storm petrels or shear waters, and you might not see any. There's just none. But again, if you have a, a good a leadership team, they take their bag of popcorn, they open up the bottles of cod liver oil, they pour it into the bag, they mix it all up. And they start throwing popcorn with this cod liver oil off the back stern of the boat. And it's unbelievable. But where you were seeing nothing, all of a sudden the shear waters start coming in or the storm petrels because they have this minute um, abil ability to sense these minute amounts of, of odor. Um, one of the things to think about, uh, the, a lot of these birds, these seabirds like storm petrels, uh, they actually find their way back to their nesting colonies by smell. Okay. So, mm. Yes, Bernie, anything? Is that okay? Yeah, Bill, we have a uh, question yeah. about, uh, you mentioned birds sensing UV light. What about infrared light, especially among nocturnal feeders? Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that, Bernie. I don't know that one. I, I haven't heard that. Maybe. I think the uh, Dennis Butcher has asked this. As far as I understand it, Dennis, um, infrared generally doesn't get seen by most animals or most groups of animals. It's rather there are separate organs that are adapted to uh, sense the heat rather than the light that comes off of infrared radiation. Well, I was wondering if that small generation of heat, even from insects in the night, would uh, give a signal to a nocturnal feeder that they could uh, approach. But uh, yes, I'm, trying to question. Think, yeah, I'm trying to think of nocturnal feeders that would be feeding on, on um, non-flying insects. Um, even, a, even, a, even an owl sensitive, if it were, and I have no no idea. If it were sensitive to infrared, could locate prey. You see, I don't know that. I mean, we know that some of the screech owls, for example, are feeding on relatively large insects like beetles and, and uh, crickets and grasshoppers and things of that nature. But I think, well, I, think there are, I think there are nocturnal ant birds and ant pittas in the dark tropics that feed on uh, insects at night. But again, those are mostly going to be moving insects. Okay, okay that's a, a good question. Thank you for bringing it up. Okay. Requires okay. further study, doctor. Yeah. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, other adaptations, hardware, these are things like wing shape and wing structure and the sternum, the legs, the feet, the structure of the feet, the bill and some other physical adaptation. These are the hardware we're talking about. The wing shapes, of course, make a big difference as to how a bird can fly, how fast can it fly, and how maneuverable it can be. So if you're a pursuit hunter, you need a very a 
shape of wing and one sort of a tail to go along with it, uh, a pursuit hunter. If you're a, a pounce hunter, like a red-tailed hawk or something like that, you can, or an owl, you can have very different wings. Okay? But here are the broad wings, again, of the red-tailed hawk. Notice again the uh, brown belly band of the eastern red-tailed hawk. Some of you hawks, uh, red-tailed hawks out where you are, are almost all dark on the breast. But they're relatively short, but they're broad. And what they're what these are designed for, notice this bird has its wings out, it has its tail fanned, so it's maximum open. And notice the primary feathers are, are open. Those are called wing slots, S-L-O-T-S. And those are very, very important for get, gaining additional lift and also for maneuvering. But so here is a relatively heavy bird that makes its living by using updrafts and thermals in order to fly around, okay? So it's using a flying perch. It's a pounce hunter. It, it sees something and then pounces on it. It is not a pursuit hunter generally. At short distance, I can, I've seen red-tailed hawks chasing squirrels, you know, but, but they're, they're not gonna chase them very, very far. It's basically they pounce on them. So those short, broad wing support soaring, okay? If you ever have a chance to go to the Southern Oceans or off California to look for albatrosses, uh, I think this, uh, this bird had uh, about a 10 foot wingspan, the black browed albatross. They have these incredibly long, narrow wings in order to take advantage of strong wind, wind currents. That's why the albatrosses tend to, as a group, tend to be in the Southern Oceans off Southern South America and the Southern Southern Atlantic, where they're very, very strong winds. And those long, long wings permit these birds to travel long distances, hundreds of miles to a feeding area away from their uh, nesting places. So the okay, very different shape of wing between that and the red-tailed hawk. Then we have, notice the iridescence on this uh, tree swallow, really beautiful. And as it turns its head, it goes from that greenish blue back to, back to black again. But those very narrow pointed wings are important for maneuvering in pursuit. This is a pursuit hunter. It's pursuing insects, flying insects. And it has to be able to move very quickly. And if you compare its wing shape and to an airplane, it's a fighter jet, okay? Because they have to be incredibly maneuverable to get away from an enemy, but also to chase one. So these, these wings are designed for rapid maneuvers in pursuit of, of their prey. Now, if you either can get to the Galapagos Islands or to Southern and South America or Antarctica, you will see uh, penguins. And it's, believe me, it's worth the trip. Uh, and so these wings are designed in such a way, they, they look like the flippers on things like whales or on seals and things of that nature. And they're, they are perfect for, for swimming if you see them underwater swimming, they look like they're flying. They're just amazing. And those wings are these flipper shaped and for pursuing, these are pursuit hunters under the water. They're pursuing fish underwater. This is a Gentoo penguin, okay? So some of the physical adaptations, uh, physiological, that the hardware again is the wing structure. This is, uh, the, the leading edge of the wing of a barred owl, okay? And notice those little hooks and bows. So the head is to the left. This is the leading edge of the wing. And those little barbs and those little hooks are designed to uh, reduce the amount of turbulence on the leading edge of the wing. Turbulence on the leading edge of the wing is what ca causes sound. So if you have these little uh, bows and hooks on the leading edge of the wing, you can fly very quietly, silently. So if you're, a, if you're an owl and you're sitting up in a tree, again, they're typically pounce hunters. They, they either sit up in a tree and wait for something and pounce on it, or they'll be flying along and find something and pounce on it. By having the, if you're sitting up in a tree and it's at nighttime and you hear uh, something like a, um, a mouse or something, or a small skunk or a raccoon or something like that, you can just come off your purse and pounce on it and the animal has no idea you're coming because it's so silent. So special, 
hawks and things like that, pursuit hunters, they don't have to be quiet. No, they're just chasing you. Even if you see them, they're still chasing you, okay? But these birds that are feeding at nighttime where silence is really important, they have those adaptations. Now, I know you don't have penguin, uh, <laughs> you don't have puffins out in um, Wyoming, but this is a bird that is, is nests off the islands off, uh, or off Maine and along the uh, Mar Canadian Maritime provinces. And this, this bird can dive down over a hundred feet in the water chasing its prey. Well, at that, as, at that depth, the, the pressure of the water is, is intense, okay? And the puffins have a very heavy sternum without any air pockets in order to protect the internal organs. So a lot of other birds will have relatively heavy sternums, but they all full of holes in order to make them light. Well, in the case of a puffin, because they're diving so deep down in the water, they have to protect their internal organs. And so that's what, what they do. Okay, and legs. Legs come in a whole variety of shapes and sizes. Things like swifts and hummingbirds. If you've ever uh, been at a banding station or, or held a hummingbird or a swift, they have almost no legs and feet at all. They're tiny, tiny things, okay? And actually, you, when you're banding them, it's, it's almost impossible to hold them by the feet. You, you just have to hold them in, in your hand. Uh, it's amazing. But, but some other uh, organisms have incredible legs, strong legs for, for doing different things. So here is the, the structure of, this happens to be a great blue heron. And notice the, uh, the, the leg just below that red arrow I'm showing you is the ankle, okay? A lot of people get confused by that. If you're standing next to a great blue heron, you'll see that its legs bow as you're seeing them. And if we were standing facing the same direction as this heron, our, our knee would be bending in the other direction. So what looks like a knee is actually the ankle, okay? Then between the two red arrows is, those are the fused bones of your foot. Okay, they, so all those little bones that we have in our feet are all been fused together to form the, the bone that go bone, compound bone that goes from the ankle to the toes. And then the toes are, it's, in other words, it's sort of walking on its tippy toes. But those very long legs like that let these birds walk out into deep water to feed, like this great egret. I know you don't get great egrets typically out where you are, but I could have had an image of a great blue heron. But so this is a huge uh, asset to these birds for its ability to walk out into water that's maybe almost two feet deep. Because there are a lot of other birds that are walking around the edges of the, this happens to be a salt pan, but uh, could be a freshwater pond and that, where they, they simply can't get out to where these birds are feeding. So again, it's partitioning off the food supply. Here is a bird that's able to feed in relatively deep water that cannot be reached by other birds, like large shore birds and things of that nature, okay? Now, this is greater roadrunner. I don't know, Bernie, whether you ever get roadrunners up in the southernmost part of Wyoming, but I know that they have them in Utah and places like in Colorado, but this is greater roadrunner. And notice the feet on this and the legs, it's really, really quite, they're, they're thick and they're heavy because this is a bird that pursues most of, most of its prey on the ground, okay? This is a cuckoo. This is, so if you have cuckoos out here, this, this is a, just a very large cuckoo, but we call it roadrunner. And its ability, those strong legs, uh, make it able to run very, very fast and change direction very quickly because it's chasing things like lizards, okay? It also will feed on small birds and other things of that nature. But the, so legs adapted adapted for running. Okay. Bill, just in answer to your question, no, there are no road runners in Wyoming. I don't believe there are any records at all. Okay, I've um, seen them in Colorado. The, yeah. yeah, Colorado, Southern Colorado, Southern Utah, uh, particularly when you get down towards the the Arizona Strip in that area, but uh, not here. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Bernie. And then we're talking about legs and the placement of the legs. Where are they on, on the animal? Uh, and it depends on whether you spend a lot of time walking on the ground or whether you're uh, pursuit hunting. Okay. Let me just uh, let me just go back here. Okay. So the, the key thing, if you are chasing fish underwater, you want your legs and feet as far back as you can get them, because that's where your propeller is most efficient at the at the stern of your boat or uh, in the case of bird, those propeller feet at the back of the of the animal. Okay, and birds have all kinds of different foot shapes, which helps them move over through the water or over land, pursuing prey, like walking across aquatic plants or grasping and holding on to prey. So here's, here's a good example of webbed feet. Notice the northern pintail. I know you get northern pintails out your way, and I don't think you get cormorants, but you may occasionally. But just notice the posture of these two birds. Look at the duck with the feet in the middle, okay? Now, it does move itself through the water, but it's not pursuing anything underwater. So just to be able to paddle along the surface eating vegetation, having your feet and your legs in the middle of your body is perfectly wonderful with your webbed feet. But look at the cormorant. This is another pursuit hunter underwater. Okay. Notice where the feet are. Those big webbed feet are way, way back at the stern end of the bird. So the, the fact that the feet are webbed and where they're placed is a huge uh, adaptation for them. Then other kinds of toes, looking at your feet, look at these lobe toes. I think you get coots out your way. Look at those, look at those feet, strange little toes with these big, big webs or lobes on them, okay? Uh, and they move themselves through the water just like a duck would and everything like that. And notice the fowl rope, which is on the right-hand side. And notice it also has lobes on the feet. Just an interesting thing, the name fowl rope means coot foot. So when they were naming the um, fowl ropes, they said, well, what other things have feet that look like this? And the coot came to mind and they named them fowl rope for coot foot. Bernie, did you have something else? Yeah, Bill, we do have a uh, coot. We've actually, um, Francis and I were up at Jackson Lake yesterday and from the dam, uh, we counted over a thousand coot. <laughs> yeah, I guess you so have. This is the time of year when they when they gather in big flat uh, big flotillas mm -hmm. at the uh, uh, at the, the lake. And one of the feeding adaptations of the bald eagle is to go dive on coot. The way the coot deal with that is they all get together in a raft, and the eagle doesn't really want to dive into an entire flock of birds. It's trying to isolate them. So um, you can see at one point a bald eagle flew overhead and all these coot, about 500 of them, moved off the shoal right into the water into one large, yeah. just dark black mass. Yeah. That, that, couldn't that's see good. Feet, couldn't see the feet. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't see the eagle's feet. <laughs> yeah. Now the, the redneck fowl rope and all the fowl ropes who have those lobes on the feet, the way they, they feed is they spin around in the water. Okay, and those feet help bring the nutrients to the surface where they can they can grab them. But how about some long toes on, on these guys? Okay, the wattled jacana. This is a bird of the New World tropics. But notice the common gallinule. This is a bird of primarily the southeastern part of the United States. But if you look at the bird uh, again, the gallinule. Notice the foot on the left. Notice that toe. Notice how long that toe is both of them, the one that's along the log and then the one that's sort of hanging down, that's so they can walk on vegetation as the jacana is on the right-hand side. So here's a bird that can walk, actually walk out on pond lilies and things of that nature in order to uh, eat fruit from the plants, but also to, they actually will lift over the leaf and look for organisms that are attached to the underside of the leaf. This is a snowy owl. This was one of those fortunate things. I was just standing next to a kiosk. I was about 30 feet away from a kiosk and the snowy owl came and landed within 30 feet of me. And I was able to get these photographs up here. But notice the sharp talon. Those talons, when you take the, um, 
the feathers away from the feet are three inches long. Okay, so they're incredibly sharp. And, and usually what they, they don't have to rip apart their prey to kill it. All they have to do is put, put those, all those talons into the, it's like stabbing them with all, a whole bunch of different knives, grasping and killing. So in terms of different, you have an isodactyl feet. Notice this is a chickadee. This is, this is sort of the most common, this is the perching birds like warblers and flycatchers and things of jays. Notice you have three toes forward and one back. Okay, so that's an isodactyl is pretty much most common. Then you have woodpeckers and parrots and owls and some other groups of birds. Psychodactyl, two toes forward, two back. Well, you, you can see actually in the image on the right hand side of this downy woodpecker, it has two toes in the hole and two toes underneath it. Okay, so for holding on to tree trunks and things of that nature. Okay. Pamprodactyl, dactyl. Okay, this, not many birds have this uh, configuration of toes. These happen to be speckled mouse birds that are uh, from Kenya, but that was the only example. I had a photograph of a bird that has this type of toe arrangement, okay? But on most of our birds, especially our passerines, our songbirds, they have the structure of three toes forward and one back, and that the halux or hallux is that toe in the back, okay? Uh, this is the, 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 the first digit of the foot, okay? And so many, many of them have this uh, in order to cling on to bark or branches or to small twigs, okay? But that hallux is really, really important in some species of birds. Your nuthatches, okay, or the black and white warbler. Matter of fact, the white-breasted nuthatches or nuthatches uh, are one that comes uh, to our feeders here, but I think you have pygmy nuthatches out where you are, and they both, they have this very long hind toe or halo, so that they can actually come down trees head first. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, because most all the other birds are going the other direction. They're going up, like woodpeckers and things, like they search on the way up. But by coming down, you can get all the uh, food that other organisms have missed. And then the black and white warbler also has that long halix, and it also will come down trees head first. And the black and white warbler is actually known as the nuthatch warbler because of its behavior. But here's a special adaptation uh, that these birds take great advantage of. Well, it always amazes me during the winter when we're here and if the temperature is minus 10 degrees and there's a 35 mile an hour wind and it is really, really cold, that we have birds like geese and ducks, and this happens to be an immature herring gull, they can actually stand on the ice without freezing them. And they have, uh, they have a counter current exchange in their legs and in that the arteries and the veins wrap around each other so that the warm blood coming out of the heart towards the feet is actually warming up the blood in the veins that are going back up. So the heart is not shocked, okay? And they can actually basically turn off the blood supply to the feet or turn it way, way down so they're not losing a lot of heat out of their feet. Well, hook bills, hardware adaptations, so, well, if there's any question in your mind that this is a, a flesh eater, uh, I mean, it looks like a can opener, you know, the, in order to rip open the, the fur of, uh, of carrion, uh, get in through the scales of fishes, or to rip apart a, a waterfowl with ducks. Uh, most people think of bald eagles as being fish eaters, which they certainly are, but they also are very good duck hunters, and they also eat a lot of carrion. Okay, that, Okay, the hook bill, this is a cormorant. Notice the little hook at the end of the bill in order for catch it, it swims underwater to catch a fish and that hook bill helps it hold on to it. Okay. The hook bill again on this, this is the parrot. This is red, red lord parrot from, from uh, Costa Rica. And this is uh, use that hook bill in order to rip fruit and get in through, uh, rip the fruit off the, what it's eating, okay. The chisel-shaped bills, of course, of, of our um, 
woodpeckers, nuthatches, things like that. They're going into little crevices, they're making holes, and that chisel shape is really perfect for uh, getting into wood and also splitting open uh, things like seeds and so forth. The fine bill, this is the yellow male, yellow warbler. By the way, there are 53 different subspecies of yellow warblers. So this is a tremendous amount of variation in these. But it has this tiny little bill. It's just, just creating uh, and, and pulling little uh, insects off. Notice again, the small size of the eye, because this is a bird that feeds out in the open. Okay. okay. Then you have the thick bills, like for this is the purple finch, the male purple finch eating seeds. And I don't know, Bertie, whether you ever get crossbills or often get crossbills, but this is a bird that's an eruptive species here in the east. We own, some years we don't see any of them. And then next year we may three, have three or 400 of them right in a small area. But notice how that bill- well, we do. Yeah. We do have red crossbills. We also have white wings. And about 200 miles to the west in the Twins Fall, Twin, Fall, Iowa, Twin Falls, Iowa area, there's a, um, a relatively new species of crossbill, the cassia crossbill. Yes, yeah, they, they, they could say that there may be five or six different species of, cross, of red crossbills now. Well, the cassia is pretty interesting because it's, um, it's Loxia sinuscioris, which means without squirrels. Mm -hmm. The two mountain ranges that it inhabits have no squirrels. Yeah. <laughs> so the cassia crossbill is the only seed vector for the pines and it doesn't have any competition for the food source from the squirrels it's yeah. a very it's not just separated on the uh vocalizations yes but we do have yeah. red cross bills and especially white wings here yeah well that's that's good good thank you bernie but notice how those bills cross over uh and you can get pliers that you squeeze the pliers and it opens things up well that's exactly what these uh the cross bills do with that with the bill so if you have a pine cone and you have the scales on the pine cones and between those scales are where the seeds are. So the crossbill comes in, turns his head sort of to the side, puts his, shoves his bill in between the two scales and opens a bill and that opens up the scales so the bird can stick its tongue in and grab the seed. And then you have these extraordinary, this is a sunbird, this is a sunbird from Kenya but the, you have a lot of these trumpet shaped flowers that, that have curved and these bills are ideal for going into those flowers to get the nectar. Okay. Then you have some, some really strange, this is brown, uh, this is black skimmer. And, and notice the bill, the top mandible is much shorter than the lower one. And it flies along, it has very uh, shallow wing beats and it flies along and it just drags its lower mandible just through the surface of the water. And as it swims along, when it hits a fish, it closes its beak. So it's feeding on those tiny little fishes that are right at the top surface within an inch or two of the, uh, of the surface of the water. Okay. Then you can have serrated bills, a different bill shape. This happens to be an American flamingo. Okay. But notice how it feeds with its bill upside down. Well, at least from our perspective, it looks like it's upside down. It's used to, for straining food out of the water column. So, so here's the process. It turns its head sort of upside down. It takes in a mouthful of water. This is briny water. They're after brine shrimp and brine flies and things of that nature. And they take a mouthful of water and then they force that water out of the mouth through these serrated sides of the beak and those, that serrations strains out the water. So the water passes through, but any of the brine shrimp and brine shrimp larvae and things of that nature that are left in the mouth, that's what they eat. This is exactly what baleen whales do, okay? And when they're feeding like the humpback whales and things of that nature, okay? Then another serrated, this is a red-breasted merganser. You get mergansers out there in Wyoming. Uh, especially during migration, but notice how long and thin that bill is, but it has all these serrations. They're not teeth, but they look like little teeth in order for grabbing um, slippery prey. This is to me is one of the most beautiful and strange looking ducks. This is Northern Shoveler. And it usually feeds by just swimming along and shoveling up the, 
little uh, plants that are growing at the surface of the water, like pondweed and things of that, and algae that are done. But notice that the size of that beak, it's huge. And it basically goes along and it, it's spatulate shaped beak. It's, it's wider than it is tall. And uh, that's pretty cool. You have, um, let's see, blue winged teals. If you could uh, familiar with green winged teal and blue winged teal. Green winged teal and blue winged teal, even though they're both named teal, they're not particularly closely related to each other. And the blue winged teal has a wider, more spatulate shaped bill than does the green winged teal for the same purpose that the shoveler does. Yes, Bernie. Yeah, Bill, we have cinnamon teal in uh, breeding numbers, uh, fairly substantial ones. Uh, we have blue winged teal, low breeding numbers, but uh, fairly prevalent on migration. Yep. And we certainly get northern shovelers on migration, but the, uh, the heartland of northern shoveler breeding in the area is definitely the Salt Lake, Great Salt Lake. I understand the there thousands are a of them there. A lot of them down there and a lot of cinnamon teal as well. Yep. Thank you. Okay. And then you have these long stout bills like egrets and herons and things like that. And uh, if you are some kind of prey animal, that beak is, is bad news. Okay. Because they will eat fishes, frogs, pollywogs, snakes, small mammals, everything. Okay. Then you have these long slender bills. This is, is a marbled godwit. Notice this slightly upcurved bill. Again, that's for probing down into the mud, looking for, again, for worms or bivalves, things of that nature. Now, this is, well, this is, it's not unique, but there are only a very few birds that feed in this way. This is anhinga. They have a number of different anhingas in Africa, for example. And this is one of the few birds that actually spears its prey, where the egrets and herons grab onto whatever they are. These birds actually spear the, the prey. Uh, under, it swims underwater. And if it sees a fish, it actually darts out and spears it and impales it on the end of its beak. This, this has a couple other names. A snake bird is one. And water turkey is the other names. Okay. So we have a question about kingfishers on that. Yeah. Yes. Good. Are they grabbers or spearers? They're grabbers. Yeah. No, they yeah. grab. They don't spear. It, it, the bill looks like they could, but they don't. They 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 are grabbers. Okay. But this is one of the anhinga. I I can't think of any other bird in North America offhand that does this. Okay. And. Note, if you look at the image of the Anhinga on, on the left-hand side, that very, very sharp beak. And in photography, you get some great shots and then you just miss some great shots because the one on the right-hand side, a, a half a second or a second before I took that photograph, that actually had that fish that you see flying up in the air impaled on its bill. But what it does, it's impaled on its bill and then it sort of opens the bill and throws it up in the fish up in the air and grabs it and eats it. So anyway, so the flexible tip, okay? This is, uh, we talked about the dowager before, how it pro probes in the mud and then senses the chemical makeup of, the, of whatever it's seeing. But this has something, it's called distal rincon kinesis. Okay, so here's a bird that has a bill, let's say maybe six inches long, five, at least five inches long and stuck it down in the mud. Well, try it sometime. Take your two fingers in the mud and stick your two fingers in the mud and then try to open them. Okay, really hard to do it. Well, so if you if you were a bird that had to open your entire bill in order to pull out whatever you captured, it would be very, very difficult to do it. But what they can do is just move the very tip of their bill, open up both, both upper and lower mandibles, just open the tip of it so they could grab that little mollusk or that worm and pull it back up. So uh, distal means away. So that's the tip of the bill. Rincon kinesis is, rincon has to do with your nose, like a rhinoceros, okay? And kinesis means it can move, okay? So, okay. So in terms of shorebirds, this, they have the greatest diversity of bills. Look at the plovers. You have golden plovers passing through here in the proper habitats, wimbrels, and 
uh, avocets. So shorebirds have the greatest diversity in bill shapes. So other, some of the other adaptations we'll just talk about quickly is uh, rictal bristles, a lot of flycatchers and some warblers, and certainly a lot of the night hunting birds have these feathers. They're actually feathers, but they look like whiskers right around the front of their face. And they can detect the slightest little vibration. So as they're going to catch an insect, just like cats have little whiskers, just help sense where they are. These little bristles can help the bird locate exactly where that insect is, okay? The, we talked a little bit about the, their ears, about being si far apart, but in a lot of birds, especially owls, the ears are off-centered with each other. Again, as a way to, to be able to differentiate distance and location of things. And then a lot of birds like woodpeckers have very, very long tongues that actually wrap around behind the brain in order so that they can reach way in to a tree cavity in order to get uh, insects, okay? So updrafts, some of the uses of environmental factors and how birds can do this. Uh, wind currents off the waves, albatrosses and, and shearwaters. And by being able to use updrafts that are coming off the waves, think of on the ocean, a large lake or something like that. You have a wave that forms. If the wind is coming, the wind has to go up over the wave. So that updraft that is being caused by that. Help. So here's, here's the idea. You have a bird that's flying over the waves like a shearwater or a gull or lots of, lots of birds will do this. They, as the wind is hitting this wave in front of them, the wind goes up as shown by the red arrow. That gives an updraft. So the birds gain elevation. Okay? And then they use that gain elevation in order to now glide back down into the next trough of the wave to get the next updraft that's coming off a wave. So this is a huge help for especially seabirds in order to be able to travel long distances with using minimal amount of energy. Okay, so just, you know, many, many different feeding te techniques and so much identification can actually be done by watching behavior. This is grazing. I think I see Canada geese and snow geese and things like of that nature. And I think they, they look like sheep or goats or cows. I mean, they're actually walking across open fields or golf courses or whatever, uh, just feeding on um, the grass. Okay. They can do that. The probing, we've already talked about probing. That's a different feeding technique. Now, you don't have oceans out where you are, but we have things like sandling. And if you ever go to the beach or on the ocean, you'll see sandlings and what they do is they, as a wave comes in, they run up the beach ahead of the wave. And as that wave goes out, they run after the wave as the wave is receding. And they're, they're, they're seeking, searching and pecking out any small organisms that the wave has stranded upon the beach as the wave went back up. As the wave comes in, of course, the birds run back up the beach again, and then they run after the next wave. So this search and peck method uh, is used is visual hunting. Now you have, uh, if not exactly where you are, you have towhees and spotted towhees, maybe a little bit further south of you, but you get fox sparrows, I believe in the wintertime. They have a way of called hop scratching, is they'll, they'll be in a place and they sort of hop up in the air and they kick their feet back. And that covers any bark mulch or covers over any leaves or any other debris. So they just, they'll do it. They just sort of hop up in the air and as they hop, they kick their feet back and that uncovers some of the vegetation so they can look for seeds or insects or things of that nature. Well, ospreys, okay, kingfishers, rough-legged hawks. Again, they hover, they just hover, and then they pounce on prey. The stalkers, these are especially true of great blue herons and e or large egrets, but great blue herons, they'll very often stay almost motionless just looking down into a small pond or a wet area or, or something. This happens to be a salt marsh, but or out in the field, just moving very, very slowly, just listening and watching for any organism. And they just st almost stand motionless until they see something and then they dart down and grab it. Okay. This is a, a storm petrel. This is a bird. This is only the size of a tree swallow. This is an ocean bird. This happens to be one I photographed in the Galapagos Islands. And this is, uh, by the way, a petrel, 
Petro, it looks like this boat, notice this bird, it's facing into the wind, the wind is coming from the left, and it just flutter, puts its wings up at an angle, so the wind coming at it gives it a slight amount of lift, and then it just kicks with its feet along the surface of the water to move it along looking for prey. And so the term petrol comes from St. Peter. St. Peter was reported to have walked on water. So when sailors saw these tiny little seabirds way out in the ocean, they thought there must be some divine quality to them because they were walking on water as Peter did, okay? So gleaning, again, this is a kinglet. You get kinglets out in your area. They're just picking off tiny little insects off vegetation. This is a tropical kingbird, but you have Western kingbirds that do the same thing. They will typically sit on a branch, fly out, catch something and come back to the same area again. They're really nice to photograph because you can be pretty certain they're gonna come right back to where they started. Okay. Hunting in flight, martins and swallows and common nighthawks at nighttime. This is a really beautiful purple martin. Now, I think you have, might have purple martins during migration because I know they're big nesting colonies of purple martins up in Manitoba, for example, in that year, Saskatchewan. Okay. And th then you have your plunge divers. Uh, this is uh, kingfisher, certainly fits in any terns you have, brown pelicans, things like that, especially your kingfishers. Now, this one happens to be plunge diving head first. Okay. And it's amazing that these birds are flying along and all of a sudden they dive straight down. They have to time it just perfectly so that as they're coming near the water, so they're not crashing with full speed, they sort of pull the head back and push it forward again and they collapse their wings so they don't break a wing. Okay. Surface diving, this happens to be, you have uh, uh, diving ducks out like the um, uh, common golden eye that you saw in the uh, treatment pond out there, they dive underwater. This happens to be a white winged scoter, an ocean bird, but just, this is it. I'm really fortunate to get this image. Here is a, uh, a bird, white winged scoter on the surface. It then dived down and it was, I was fairly close to this and the water was only about six feet deep. So I was able to actually photograph it when it was underwater and it came up with what's called a razor clam. And a lot of these birds do exactly that. They'll go after freshwater mollusks and things like that. They dive down, probe in the mud, grab it, swallow it whole. As this bird is doing, it swallowed that razor clam, which was at least four and a half inches long, all in one piece. So feeding. Kleptoparasites. This is a bird that steals from other birds. Magnificent frigate birds, Jaegers do this. A lot of birds do it. And they just fly around. They, they don't feed a lot, they don't catch a lot of their own food. They will chase gulls or terns and make them, by, by grabbing the tail of the turn or the gull or the end of the wing, force the bird to give up whatever it's caught. And then the frigate birds just fly down and catch what it's stolen. Now here is a great blue heron as a kleptoparasite. Notice in slide number one, there are two common mergansers. There are two male common mergansers. And the, the merganser on the right is trying to steal the fish from the merganser on the left. Well, in comes this great blue heron and said, enough of that, I want the fish. So it flies right in, grabs onto the merganser, that, the one that's underneath its wing, forces the merganser to give up the fish. As you can see in sign number three, it's a pretty big fish. And off the heron goes with its prey, the, the, what it has stolen. So kleptoparasitism, spinning in water. We looked at these fowl ropes before, but they actually sit in the water and they spin around in a circle. And that movement of the water like that tends to bring the nutrients from deeper in the water to the surface and the birds just peck at it and grab it as they're going around in circles. Now you have dippers. Uh, I believe you have them during migration. I don't know that they breed out there, Bernie, in Wyoming but they actually walk, it's a songbird. This is a passerine. It's just, just like a warbler or flycatcher in terms of, it's a passerine form, but it walks in the stream and then walks underwater looking for aquatic insects and larvae like dragonfly larvae and things of that nature, and then pops up again and then walks along the rocks and then walks back in the water, under the water and comes back up again. Yes, Bernie. Yeah, Bill, um, dippers are common breeders in the, 
rocky streams here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a, this is just an amazing one. How it can actually stay down. So it just doesn't pull back up to the surface is always interesting to me. But walking underwater. In the, in the New World Tropics, we have ant followers. Army ants will go through the jungle for mil, literally millions. I've been in the, in, the, in the tropics, in the rainforest, and actually heard the approaching of army ants just as they're walking millions of them through the forest. Well, as these army ants, they'll eat everything, anything, okay? And so birds that are trying to escape from the army ants, these ant following birds like this gray headed tanager, and there are many, many species that do this, they simply stay around flocks of the army ants. And as the moths and things like this are trying to escape away from the army ants, these, are, these birds are right around the edges of the army ants picking off anything that is trying to flee away from the army ants. Boat followers, okay, you don't have too many of these. I think this is intra-species cooperative. This is Harris's hawk. And I believe you have Harris's hawks, at least occasionally. They're certainly in Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona. And they maintain family units together. So they're, they're cooperating where you may have a, a, a parent set and a couple generations back that are all staying together in order to hunt cooperatively. So in other words, Last year's generation, or maybe even the years before generation, is helping the parents find food for the current nestlings. Okay, and then up we, where we are, intraspecies cooperation, where groups of birds get together and just, they'll get at the end of a mud flat or a small pond, and they will actually walk or swim together across a pond, forcing all the fishes up to one end of the pond where they're much easier to catch, okay? And they're tool users. Okay, this is a woodpecker finch from the Galapagos Islands. I photographed this is not a particularly good image, but the lighting was terrible. But anyway, they use small sticks or thorns in order to reach into cavities in order to try to get or to get a larva that's in there. So they're actually using tools. And another tool maker are gulls. Okay, we they they will this happens to be with a blue mussel. So at high at the low tide area, they'll fly out in the mud flats, pick up one of these mussels, they'll fly back. This happens to be a state park where they have these picnic areas. They'll take the mussel up in the air and drop it so they break open so they could get at the organism inside. Okay, and caching your food. Now, I believe you have acorn woodpeckers. Um, this, is, this is the clown, I think, of the woodpecker group. But notice this uh, cache tree. This happens to be a telephone pole that these uh, acorn woodpeckers have made um, these holes into, the, into this telephone pole in order to store their acorns. So if they have a bad year or a bad season, they can go to their food storage. So they're, they're, they're really thinking ahead. These birds are really, really smart and they're saving food for a bad day. The crop, this happens to be uh, when I first started birding, uh, Bernie, I think you too, this was called a Canada J, and then they changed it to Gray J, and only recently they can, uh, changed its name back to Canada J again. And the, the crop is in a large part of the esophagus, so whenever we probably shouldn't do it, but one of the things that we always do in an area where there are gray jays, we make sure that we have peanuts and mixed nuts and things like that, and we put the take places where I know they're gray jays, you put out your hand and they come in fly and take it. But notice this, the bulging throat. So that crop is where they're storing the food in order to carry it away and they go hide it and come back and get some more. Okay. Okay. And changes in diet, food security. This is a robin. We think of robins as be eating worms and things like that, which they certainly do. But during the winter time, when, the, when in New England and certainly out in Wyoming, when everything is frozen up, they're not gonna catch any worms, so they change their diet to fruit, okay? And in dire circumstances, now, I don't, I think this was a terribly, terribly embarrassed, terribly embarrassed uh, peregrine falcon that it was so desperate for food that it actually started eating a dead fish. Well, in summary, the, through the species of evolution, birds have gained so many different physical and behavioral traits that are wonderful for helping with identification. It's made birds be able to use almost every habitat on Earth in order to.
Okay. And so yep. birds are classified by their primary diets. Many, many birds, as we said before, can be eating seeds a lot of the time, but insects at other times. Okay, Bernie, I think that is it for now for the summary. If there are any questions I'd, or needs for clarification, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I've got one question here, Bill, um, from Jeff Fanny. When robins are cocking their heads when they are feeding, are they listening for worms? They, that's what I understand, but they're, they're primarily visible hunters, hunter, visual hunters, but apparently they can hear organisms that are right in the ground. Yep. But it's, it's primarily uh, visual. Yeah. Any other questions, please throw them into the chat. And thank you for your patience Bill, when my system went south. Bill, this is a wealth, literally. It was a treasure trove. And um, it's so great. I mean, you, you organized it so well and it makes it so clear that we're, you know, when we talk about birds, we're, we're talking about a vast array of feeding strategies uh, without even really talking about the specific food sources. It's just, you can tell what a bird eats by how it's built is what it comes down to. Yeah, and, and feeding behavior could be such an important aid in field identification. Yeah. yeah, it really is. Even, especially with shorebirds, when they're that far away and they're going to fly as soon as you move, then watch what they eat and how they eat it. I think one of the joys beside the beauty of these things is just watch their behavior. What are they doing? You know, it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, next month, um, we're going to have a presentation by Dally Edmonds of Audubon Rockies. And she's going to be talking about our iconic bird here, Bill, the sage grouse. Yes. And uh, iconic and controversial. And the, um, the largest habitat conservation plan in North America, which is sage grouse. Yes. And how is it doing? And uh, Dally is a, a really a Wyoming person. She's a, did her uh, master's in zoology and uh, on pronghorn antelope out of University of Wyoming in Southern Wyoming. And she worked for Wyoming Game and Fish Department and the Wyoming Wildlife Federation. That's going to be October 12th. And I think we're going to learn a lot about an iconic bird of Wyoming and uh, an important bird in Jackson Hole who's in trouble. Bill, I can't thank you enough. Well, Bert, it's um, my pleasure, always. It, it's just fabulous, as as was your as was your migration talk, and we hope to have you back again sometime. Oh, it would be my pleasure, Bernie. It's good to see you in France. Right. Yep, we'll we'll see you soon. I think. Okay. Well, thank then. You. I, and good evening, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody.